My life began when I was 11 months of age. I was taken to the hospital with my mum and my sister had an ear infection. And as we were leaving, I'm much more of a hugger, I don't really do the handshake thing. And I give the doctor a big hug and his knee brushes my stomach and he thinks that that doesn't feel right. That afternoon, I'm flown to Sydney Hospital. The following morning, I was diagnosed with an incurable cancer of the central nervous system called neuroblastoma stage four. Doctor said, no chance of survival, take your boy home and allow him to live the next few months with his family because there's nothing that we can do. But like everybody in this room, we all have choices and the choices that we make each and every day can reshape and remold and redefine our future. My mum asked one question. I don't wanna know what the chances are my son dying is. I just wanna know what the chances are my son surviving is. The doctors gave me a 96% death rate. They said, go home. But my mum looked at my glass being 4% full and not 96% empty. I started chemo on my first birthday. My chemotherapy cycle was nine days on, three days off, nine days on, three days off. Not for weeks, not for months, but for years. I was on that same cycle until my fourth birthday when a doctor came in and said, Kerry, we're sorry, the treatment's no longer doing the job. We need to go into surgery. I went into surgery. Six hours later, the doctors came out and said, we didn't get it all. There's now nothing we can do. My father and my three older sisters were flown from Coffs Harbour down to say goodbye. But the next day, a doctor came in from America. He said, we're trialing a drug, it's called DTIC. Never been trialed on humans before, only on animals. We're gonna trial it on 25 kids. And I truly believe that outside of love, hope is the most powerful word in the English dictionary. This instilled hope into our lives. We started this drug 9 a.m. Tuesday morning. Within 24 hours, we were all transferred from the oncology ward to the burns unit. The after effects of this drug were so bad that we were completely covered from head to toe in blisters. What they would do is they would lie us in baths full of ice trying to prevent our brains from frying. Within one month, 20 out of the 25 kids had passed away. Within 90 days, 24 out of the 25 kids were dead. My mum, she would sit there and she would watch a doctor come in and zip up a body bag and wheel them out because of the same drug that she chose to put me on. I say to people all around the world that I'm one of the lucky ones but I never sound one of the lucky ones because I'm still alive. I sound one of the lucky ones because I wasn't my mum. My mum had it tough. She had to make a choice to inject the drug into a child that has killed everybody that had ever taken it. I was on that drug until my seventh birthday, until one day I was finally allowed to go home. The doctor said to my mum, your son, he will never go to school. He will never play sport. He'll be a housebound baby. And if he reaches his teenage years, it'll be a miracle. But we believed in miracles. And my mum wanted my dreams to come true. When I was lying in hospital, as you can see in the pictures, I had to have the needle in my head. And my mum bought me a Velcro glove and a Velcro ball. And she'd sit at the end of the bed and she'd lob the ball to me. I'd catch it and I'd throw it back. So she gets further and further away until eventually I said to her, I have a dream and that dream is to one day play baseball in America. And people laughed at me. Nobody in your life will tell you what you can do. They'll only ever tell you what you can't do. My dream was to play baseball in America and I wanted to do everything in my power to make sure that happened. And there was a lot of hiccups along the way. A lot of hiccups. I had my first heart attack when I was 12. I had glandular fever. I had bacterial meningitis. But people kept telling me I wouldn't do it. So it made me work really hard to make sure I could do it. And at the age of 15, I was lucky enough to make the Australian under 16 baseball team and come to America to play baseball and get a chance to achieve my dream. I played over here when I was 15, 16, 17. When I was 17, I was down in Texas playing baseball and a scout came up to me and said, Mike, you're definitely not the biggest, clearly, and nor are you the strongest, but the passion you bring to this team is something we want to reach in and grab. I was lucky enough at the age of 17 to sign a contract and live in America and play baseball. But as you know, life is like a roller coaster. You can get to a pinnacle point in your life and it can get taken away from you in a heartbeat. At the age of 18, I was playing baseball in Phoenix, Arizona. I slid into a base at second and I woke up three days later. And at the age of 18, I suffered my career ending heart attack and I was sent home. I was a depressed boy. I thought life wasn't fair. When I got home, I did a TV show on Australian stories. It's been viewed by over 4 million people around the world. 
And I got a job in one of the most boring industries on the planet. I got a job in banking, no disrespect to anybody in finance. But this guy, day three, tall old guy came in. He said to me, Michael, I'm Tom, I'm the CEO, let's have a chat. I had no idea what CEO stood for, but I just went in there and listened. And as we were walking past, someone said, he's the boss's 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 boss. And I thought, he's rich, I need to impress him. So I went in there and he asked me the dumbest question ever. He said, Michael, where do you see yourself in five years time? I had no idea where I was gonna be on a Friday night. And that's really all I cared about and who I was hanging out with. I had no idea where I was going to be in five years' time. But my mum, she always taught me, son, shoot for the moon. And if you miss, you'll end up in the stars. So I said to him, Tom, in five years' time, I'm going to take your job. He hated me. Don't ever say that to your boss, okay? They do not like you when you say that. But within 12 months, I was the youngest bank manager in Australia. Within two years, youngest area manager. Three years, youngest state manager. Within the fourth year of being with this company, I was the youngest national sales development manager for one of the largest companies in the world. At the age of 23, I had 600 staff, had 120 banks around Australia and New Zealand. I made lots of money. I lived in a million dollar house, had a $100,000 sports car, wore the Armani suits and the Rolex, and I reported directly to my mate Tom. I was one step away from taking his job. I remember Friday afternoons, he'd say, how are your numbers? And I'd say, how's your superannuation looking? Because I wanted to take his job. But one day I received a phone call that changed my life forever. My mum and dad separated and I invested the money that my mum received from the settlement. And unfortunately that was about two months before the GFC hit and I lost everything. And I couldn't take care of my mum. So I had to put her in a trailer. I got really sick, I got taken to hospital, I had bacterial meningitis, had fluid on the brain. And then I had a stroke down the right hand side of my body. And I would pray every night, but I wouldn't wake up in the morning. I just wanted God to take me. But I kept waking up every morning. And I realized all I need to do is give back to the world. It's not about what you take, it's about what you give. I thought the saying was, the more you give, the more you shall receive. But that saying is wrong. The saying should be, the more you give, expecting nothing in return, the more you shall receive. So I thought, I need to do something for this world where these people are never, ever going to be able to give me anything back. So I went to this place. I went to Haiti in 2010. An earthquake hit Haiti, killed 316,000 people, left two and a half million people homeless. I went there and I realized that education is so important. So I went there and I rebuilt a school for 235 little kids. Because I found out that these kids were getting raped on the way to school of a morning and raped on the way home from school. So I took the school to them. We built a school up in the remote village of Bouvier. Took us eight hours to get there. And on the way back, I went past these little kids. These kids changed my life. They touched my heart. These kids were all in this orphanage. They were all around tables and chairs. They had no clothes, no food. And I met this one boy. I said, what's the best part about living here? He goes, I bet I get a bowl of rice every second day. I said, what's the worst part? He said, of a night time, because of a night time, that's when my family died. And I have to share a bed with two little boys. And there's a tarp over the top of us. And every time it rains, I get soaking wet. He said, but it doesn't really matter whether it rains or not. I still get soaking wet because the two little boys that I share a bed with, they both still pee their pants. I spent about eight months on the road. I spent a lot of time in hotels. And there are sometimes I get frustrated at the hotel. I walk in and I think to myself, why do I need 16 pillows? I don't need 16 pillows, I need one. And then you go to get in the bed and you think the cleaner thinks that you are a cardboard cutout because they tuck the sheets in so flipping tight that you can't bloom and well get in there. So you rip the pillows off, rip the sheets off just so you can get into bed. And he's not whinging that he's getting peed on. He's pumped because he gets a bowl of rice every second day. I came back to Australia, I raised a whole heap of money and I went back to Haiti in 2013. I rebuilt the orphanage from the ground up. And my wife and I, unfortunately, due to my health challenges, we can't have kids. But I'm very proud to say I'm the parent of 25 of the most cutest, beautiful, brightest little black babies in Haiti. I get to look after them 365 days a year. I think there are too many charities in the world that take so much. My charity, Frontier Projects, is every cent gets sent. I wanted every last little dime to be able to go to these kids. And that's the greatest thing that I could do for someone else. I think that I went to Haiti because I want to do something for somebody that would never be able to return the favor. And I tell you, these kids have brought more joy, more satisfaction, and more happiness to my life than I could ever imagine. 
Last year, I was fortunate enough to be in a position to be able to do something for the most inspirational, the most influential, and the most loving person I've ever met, and that was my mum. On June 16 last year, I was lucky enough to put a pink ribbon on a door to a brand new home. And I got a chance to buy my mum a brand new house. To be able to give back to someone that has sacrificed so much for me is without a doubt the greatest gift. And I know I have a mortgage that comes out every single week and it makes me have to work until I'm 100 so I can pay it back. But every time that mortgage comes out, it puts a smile on my face knowing that I've been able to help her. And when I was seven, I heard through the curtains the doctor say to my mum, he will never go to sport, he will never play baseball, he will never ever go to school and if he reaches his teenage years, it'll be a miracle. And my mum, she walked out and I said to her as if I didn't hear, what did the doctor say? And she said, everything's gonna be okay, son. When I was 12, I had a heart attack and the doctor said to my mum, he will never play sport again. She walked out and I said, what did he say? And she said, everything's gonna be okay, son. And earlier this year, I finally got a chance to return the favor. Unfortunately, earlier this year, the doctors found four tumors in my throat. I've never seen my wife cry so much in all my life. The doctor said to me, Michael, we're sorry, but tomorrow's not guaranteed. You need to slow down. But that's one thing we all have in common because no one's guaranteed. I think that life is not about the amount of days that you live on this earth, but it's about what you fit into those days that allows you to live a remarkable life. And I remember driving home and she called me, my mum, and she said, Mike, what did the doctor say? And I said to her, mum, everything's gonna be okay. Every one of us, every single day, is blessed with the air that we breathe, the opportunities that we have. And I challenge you every single day to get out of bed and do something that your future self will be proud of.